Well, it's been quite the journey as we've been working our way through the book of Genesis in our week-by-week study through the promises of God in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and, and still holding out hope for the future of that consummation. It's been a really challenging series because there are some, let's face it, some difficult stories in the book of Genesis, but it's important for us to see them in light of the greater story of the Bible to help us look at that story and to see it in full focus. We're joined today by Courtney Doctor, who is the author of a book called From Garden to Glory, How Understanding God's Story Changes Yours. I'm really excited to get into the contents of this book, especially as a resource and a Bible study that can help people walk through what we've been practicing for the last couple of months. So Courtney, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Why don't you get us started by telling us a little bit about yourself and sort of the impetus of this book? What was the uh, the seed that started this whole uh, conversation, this whole road to uh, writing uh, from Garden to Glory? Yeah, we, um, my husband and I actually went to seminary together in our 40s. So at this point, we had two boys in college. Our two girls were going into kind of that middle school, high school age and we packed up everything and moved to St. Louis and went to seminary and the very first class that we took is called Covenant Theology and we sat in this class and it was it was the meta narrative of scripture it was teaching us to look at the bible as one cohesive story from beginning to end and it rocked my world i mean i just sat there and i thought i've never heard this before And what happened in my heart, I mean, I just loved the word more. I trusted the word more. I loved the Lord more. And so I thought I have got to somehow take what I'm learning. We had a professor say, you're not the end of your own education. So that was like a challenge, right? And I thought I need to take what I'm learning and and make it accessible for anybody that can't pack up and move to St. Louis or some other seminary and sit in a year long class. So that was really the impetus behind it was it it was such an eye opening thing to learn that I wanted to be able to share it with others. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're talking about. You learn something new and it sparks such joy and excitement and depth mm-hmm. in your walk with Christ. And you want to figure out a way to dispense that to other people. But you tackled one of the most challenging <laughs> of theological uh, topics of really understanding how the Bible fits together from start to finish. Uh, that means you're an expert where a lot of uh, scholars and theologians, they kind of focus in on one sort of uh, further down the road uh, specialty. What we're talking about here is Genesis to Revelation. We got to be understanding and comprehensive about the whole Bible. Uh, So tell us a little bit about what this book is about that is talking about from the garden all the way to glory. Well, the approach is to look at the main parts of the story, kind of the main places where something significant happens and moves the story forward. So there are different ways to approach this meta narrative of of the Bible, the story that it is, and you can trace themes all the way through it, or you can just go through each book of the Bible and look at how that impacts the story as a whole. But what From Garden to Glory attempts to do is take you through as if you're looking at a narrative arc of any story. There are certain moments that are more significant than others. And so it's understanding what was happening, what the plot line is, how God drives the story forward, what he's doing. Uh, and it really looks at like all the parts of a good story. What's the introduction? What's the conflict? How is the conflict resolved? What happens after it's resolved? Um, so that we can better understand how God put this beautiful story together. That is an interesting premise, and it's something we've talked a bit about quite a bit, is the fact that the Bible is one big story, but we often start to see it for its pieces, and we kind of see it in the parts we miss the greater whole. So tell us a little bit about why that struggle, that tension of seeing, uh, I mean, 66 different books, we can see them all as 66 different stories, and even those containing sub-stories, how do they all actually fit together into one grand story? Well, we really can't understand the parts outside of the whole if we just jump in it. And I think we intuitively know that, you know, you're not going to pick up any good piece of literature and open to chapter 14 and expect to understand 
what's going on. And so the Bible is actually no different. We really can't understand what's happening. Say even in, in you know, chapter three, we all are like, oh, Genesis, Exodus, what? Leviticus, you know, and it's like, we don't understand it. But if we're reading it in the storyline, it does make more sense. And so that's true of each book of the Bible, or we start the story at the manger, or we start the story at the cross, and it's just not where the story started. So you all have been in Genesis, and you know that there was a way that things were made, and it was good, it was very good. And then you also know that something really bad, really awful happened, and it changed. It changed everything. And the entire story is really played out in light of Genesis 3.15. And so, so we're watching God Promise and fulfill, promise and fulfill over and over and over again. You, you mentioned a four-part uh, narrative, a mm-hmm. structure that's actually pretty helpful to understand as we're reading through maybe a section of the scripture to see how that four-part uh, comes together. What is that four-part structure for reading through the Bible? Well, most theologians are going to call it creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. But when we look at it in the same way that we would look at the structure of a story, we see that it's an introduction, it's a conflict, it's a climax, and it's a resolution, it's a conclusion. And and that really helped me understand why knowing those four parts is important because it's not just Bible trivia. It's not just like, oh, I know creation, fall, redemption, new creation. I actually, you know, want to better understand why those four parts are significant and what's happening in each one. And I think so often we truncate our Christian life to fall and redemption. I am a sinner. Jesus died to save me from my sins. And that is so true. And that is so glorious, but it's not all. So the story is bigger than that. We were actually created for something good and beautiful. We were created for flourishing. And the story is headed back to that place of flourishing. And so understanding that really gives us this, this joy and this hope that we, so, we are so desperate for. It's also helpful to have that sort of structure when you're reading through the Bible. So you have an idea as mm-hmm. to where it's going so you can understand, maybe there's there are some sticking points in the book of Genesis. Let's just be honest. There are points where we're like, wait, scratching our is like, yeah. what does that story have to do with anything, especially how does it fulfilled in Christ? Uh, but it's helpful to understand the sort of layout of that story because we know that this is just a part of the greater story, correct? Mm-hmm, exactly. And God is doing something. So the whole Bible is what we call progressive revelation, meaning we know more about God at the end of the story than we knew about him at the beginning of the story. And that's actually a really significant interpretive tool. So even when we're looking at a story of Abraham or Isaac, that you've been looking at these stories, how are those different than a story about David or a story about Paul? Um, They're different because God has been progressively revealing himself through the narrative um, where he's both showing who he is, telling who he is, and then showing who he is again. And so that uh, that's important for us when we get to those really hard places to understand. And we're like, what was up with Judah? Or what was up with Abraham? Um, the places that you've been, well, we have to understand part of that is understanding where we are in redemptive history, where we are in the story. And with the context of where most of us are in the New Testament, uh, we have we're on this side of the cross. Mm-hmm. Do we really need to go back? I mean, so much more has been revealed to us, right? So, do we really need to go back to the past? They were wrong. They didn't have all the clarity there. They didn't know everything that we know now. Is is the cross sufficient for us, or do we really need to go back to the Old Testament? Well, the cross is sufficient for salvation, right? And that that we need to know how we are saved. The cross is sufficient. Um, But in that sense, but we really will not understand even the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament, because primarily what's happening in the New Testament, you have you have the four Gospels and they're just declaring that all of these promises this man this baby was really born and he really lived a perfect life and he really died and he really rose again and there are all these eyewitness accounts of what had happened but they're saying he's the one promised in genesis 3 15. 
He's the perfect fulfillment of the law. He's the, he's the Davidic king that's going to sit on an eternal throne. He's the, he's the one who was promised. And then the rest of the New Testament is the explanation of what this means and how this ties into and how this is a fulfillment of all that we've been told in the Old Testament. And so we really can't understand the New Testament. The New Testament authors are explaining the Old Testament in light of Jesus. I know a lot of people that uh, have suffered with us for the past couple of months as we've been working our way through the book of Genesis, but they're just ready to get back to the New Testament. They're ready to get to the Christ story, right? <laughs> I get to Jesus, yeah. <laughs> they're just like, come on, this is so hard. Do we really have to stay here? Uh, we haven't been really conditioned to or trained and effectively helped to be able to read some of these stories in light mm -hmm. of this four-part storytelling. So can you give us some insight into why this is actually helpful, even though it's not always easy and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little bit frustrating. Why is that important for the New Testament believer? Well, I think in, in reading the stories, uh, and we, we understand that God is progressively revealing himself, progressively revealing his plan of salvation, then we don't read the stories with us as the main character. Like we're not Abraham, right? We're not Joseph. Um, we're not David. And so that becomes an important interpretive tool, but also understanding how we relate to really any doctrine through the four different categories, through through the four different parts of the story becomes really significant. So take take sin, take the doctrine of sin, which I had a professor say one time, it's not the metric by which we're meant to be measured. And I thought that was such a beautiful line. But but sin, so in the garden, we were actually able to not sin. That's what our relationship to sin was. Now we know they did, but they didn't have to. After the fall, what is our relationship with sin? Just after, just how are we all born? We're, into, we're in a relationship where we're not able to not sin. That's who we are. We are sinners from birth. But in Christ, when we are united to him by faith, we are made a new creation. We're reborn, right? Spiritually, not physically. And so our relationship to sin changes. And we are now able to not sin. That's what Romans 6 tells us, that we're dead to sin and alive to Christ. But what we look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth, the fourth part, the fourth part of the story, is that there is a day coming when we will not be able to sin. And that is glorious. And so really you can run any of these precious doctrines through this rubric and it really helps us understand how our relationship has changed first because of the fall, but then it changes again because of who we are in Christ. And then it ultimately and eternally will change for all those who are, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I think that's so important for us to keep in perspective because oftentimes our relationship, as you mentioned, is, is really truncated to just Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead without mm -hmm. any future perspective. And if we see ourselves in the proper line of the story here, where we are uh, saved and a new creation in Christ Jesus, but with the promise of a new heaven and a new earth held out to us, then we have actually something to look forward to. And to see our place in this story also gives us a mm. hope to anticipate. Yeah, it gives us purpose and meaning here as well as, you know, hope for today and hope for tomorrow. And I think so often we tend to think that, you know, here's here's the story of my faith. Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins and take me to heaven. And so great. You know, that's if that was it, that would be enough. But that's not it. It actually our salvation is now like my salvation. Your salvation is today. I am being saved not eternally, that's a one-time thing, but I am being saved from my sins right now as I'm being sanctified. I am I am working out my salvation with fear and trembling, even though it's completely accomplished on the cross, right? It is finished. And so it gives us this understanding of how we spend the rest of our Christian life from salvation until that day that we are finally glorified and not able to sin anymore. But it also then tethers our lives to the story because God is on a mission and he invites us to join him on that mission. And he is on a mission to seek and save the lost and to proclaim his name 
throughout the whole earth. And so we get to, we get to play a part in that. Uh, we get to make disciples and tell people about Jesus. And so it affects our internal, who we are as we're being sanctified and being made new. And it affects the external, how we spend the moments of our days. Can we talk about a few of these promises that uh, we're, we're really referencing? Each one of these chapters is really dealing with a promise that God has made, right? It's talking about mm-hmm. a specific reminder that God is working things out. The very first one is probably the most vague uh, with this whole idea of progressive revelation, uh, crushing the, 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 the uh, seed of the woman, crushing the head of the serpent. That's a pretty vague promise, but we can understand that in light of what Christ did for us on the cross. Can we talk about the the promises and how they have progressed over time? Yeah, but even that one in Genesis 3.15, everybody reading the Old Testament, the original audience, would have known that what had been promised was that a child, this offspring, right? That's the word used, this seed, this heir, this offspring has been promised. And in it, it's a singular masculine pronoun. He, this one male child, is going to be born. And he is going to do a mighty victorious act. So everybody, even in the Old Testament, they were every male child, you know, was Cain it? No. Was Abel? No. Was Seth? I mean, that was the hope, right? Was it Noah? No. Was it Abraham? No. I mean, that's the story that we're reading. As everybody comes on the scene, we are meant to be asking, they were asking, is this the one that was promised in Genesis 3.15? And then... As we, you know, one of the ways we can trace the promises of God is to trace the covenants. And so uh, he enters into covenant with Noah next, where he really just reestablishes the creation mandate with that he had with Adam. And then he enters into covenant with Abraham. And that's where we see, okay, he looks like he's narrowing his sights to this one man, but his sights are still set on the whole world because even in the initial interaction with Abraham in Genesis 12, he says, it's, I'm blessing you, Abraham, and I'm calling you and I'm going to make your name great, but it's for a purpose. It's so that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So now we know that this promised offspring is coming and he is going to crush the head of the enemy. But now we also know that in this person, the promised offspring, he's going to be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. And we can just kind of keep going through the covenants to see how how it just keeps adding to who this expected one is going to be, this promised one is going to be. I love that you mentioned that uh, everyone reading that would know that what it meant was a child was going to be born would bring salvation, would bring redemption to the people. And there's also in that is this expectation that it would happen in their lifetime. They were expecting yeah. that. I think it helps us understand a little bit some of the sticky points in Genesis where they're so obsessed about who they're marrying and how they're marrying and making sure that they have a child. Uh, that is such a strong point, but it's all because of that promise. Some of the issues we might have with it and understanding, well, Judah and Tamar, for instance, right? That doesn't make sense unless we understand the importance of actually seeing that the seed is carried on to provide the promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where she's actually the one acting in faith, right? She's the one that's that's saying, I believe that God is going to send a a child uh, through this line, through this. Yeah, so when we're talking about the promises of God, there are those who took it very seriously, but then there are those who didn't take it very seriously. And that's a large tension in the book of Genesis itself. But it's also something we see at the the arrival of Christ, what the people were expecting, mm. what they got was not quite exactly what they were expecting, but they were all pleasantly surprised because it was greater than their expectations. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how many actually thought it was greater at the time. I mean, that's kind of the tension that we see, right, in the Gospels is this is this very limited expectation. Even Peter in Mark's Gospel, when he says, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of God, it's this great revelation. And then just a few verses later, when Jesus is like, and I've got to die and I will be raised again, he's like, no, we are not doing that because Peter had expectations of what the Messiah would be. And he really was looking for a political savior. 
And, and Jesus was saying, Ooh, you've, you've missed it. You know, this is actually still about the whole world. Like this is, this is so much bigger than Israel and so much bigger than your lifetime. And we see that the disciples still, even in Acts uh, one, they're asking Jesus, well, what about Israel? You know what? And he's like, yeah, don't worry about that. Just go into all the world and proclaim what you have seen. And so I think that even when Jesus was on the scene, people, even those closest to him, were missing it. And I think we do the exact same thing. Our expectations are that Jesus is going to make my life better, that I'm going to be a better version of myself, that I'm going to have a comfortable you know, all things will go well. We're, we're totally shocked when suffering comes along because we have wrong expectations, wrong understandings of who Jesus is. Um, and, and we forget that this is not all there is. I think that's one of the greatest cases for your book. We have wrong expectations and we think that we've got it right. Well, Peter thought he had it right. And Adam and Eve thought they had it right with Cain. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is we need to go back and revisit these promises, revisit these stories and read them in light of, of Christ and what he's already accomplished and what Christ said mm -hmm. and what he will accomplish in coming to establish his kingdom a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that these are really important for us to go back because we may not even realize that we have maybe assumptions that need to be challenged. Mm. Yes, <laughs> we do. Sorry, <laughs> we do. We do. Um, always, right? Jesus is always more than than who we currently are thinking he is. And we always have more to learn. And, you know, it's so easy. I heard somebody say one time that so often we pray, you know, Lord, what is your will for my life? And really the better question is how can my life serve your will? That there is this kingdom that God is advancing. There is this mission that he's on. It is the, it is the redemption of all things. And, and this mission started in the garden and it's not over yet. And so we get so myopic and so short-sighted, even with our own lives. I mean, I'm speaking to myself here. It's just so easy to become very insular, very self-focused. But the story of God, the story of redemption, just lifts our eyes to something so much bigger, so much greater. And then it sets our gaze into this place that we are longing for. And it kind of untethers our hearts from, from placing all of our expectations that Jesus will meet them all in this world, because that is not what he has ever promised us. For our listeners who are saying, I don't have time to get a seminary degree and understand all of this complex theology stuff. I'm struggling to get through just the day to day. How does understanding the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation actually, uh, as your subtitle says, how understanding God's story changes yours? How does that change our listeners' story when they understand the big picture of what God is doing? I think it's just what we were just talking about. For me, that's what happened, which is why I wanted so desperately to write the book, is because it set my eyes on something higher. Now, do I have to constantly readjust my gaze? Absolutely. But it showed me, it, I, the more I understood this mission that God's on, the better able I am to align my life with that mission. So the moments of my days, how am I spending them? How am I even approaching the same things that I was doing before? So how does it change how I go to book club? How does it change how I play pickleball? How does it change how I do carpool pickup? How does it, ch how does it change the moments of my days that I interact with the people around me? And it does. It gives us purpose and meaning. I think one of the most beautiful things in scripture is in Exodus 19, right after God had delivered uh, his people from Egypt. So he had gone in and rescued them from slavery and brought them out through the Red Sea and immediately brought them to the base of Mount Sinai. And the very first thing that he said to them was, you are my treasured possession and you will be to me a holy people, a kingdom of priests. And what he was doing there was he was giving them their identity. You're treasured. You are 
delighted in. You're mine. You're my possession. You belong to me. But you're also a kingdom of priests. You've got a job to do. And this is how you're going to do it. And I think he does the exact same thing for all of us. He calls us to himself and he tells us that he loves us. He delights in us. But we stop there so often when he also is inviting us into this, this purpose of joining him on the mission mm. that he's on, the redemption of all things. I think as well, there is a challenge for many to t- to carve out the time and the uh, carve out the opportunity to dive into this book, but you've designed it in a unique way. This is not just a book that walks through. It's actually a Bible study. Uh, you've got questions, you've got resources here, you've got a great summary of each chapter at the end. Uh, this is something that can also be done in a group, so if people are feeling isolated and they don't understand it, there's an advantage to doing this in a group stuff. Mm-hmm. There is. I mean, I think we're wired to learn in community. And so when we read something and then get together and talk about it, we hear it from other people's perspectives. And, and it's kind of that, you know, Paul talks about growing up together into the unity of faith. And so I do think there's great value in doing this or really any resource like this in the context of community, if that's possible. Our theme verse for our series in Genesis has been Hebrews 12, too, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It is Jesus who is the one who made the promises, and it's Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill those promises. But the perspective here is to keep our eyes fixed on him. So even when we're in the book of Genesis or anywhere in the Old Testament, for that matter, as well as anywhere in the New Testament and even in the book of Revelation, that is to be our main focus. Your book is designed to help us to see Jesus uh, throughout the story, from Genesis to Revelation, from garden to glory. What advice do you have for our listeners on how to keep Jesus in their their sights as they are reading through some of these more challenging passages? That's a great question. I think a lot of times it's so hard, right? I'm in Leviticus right now in my quiet time. And so even just, I was underlining in my passage today, every time it said unclean and clean and cleansed. And I thought, you know, okay, how does this and relate to Jesus. And I was like, oh, he is the purifier. He is the one who is sent that will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I think sometimes it's just asking that simple question of how does this really kind of bizarre passage, you know, where I was today in in Leviticus, how does that reveal Jesus? And so sometimes it's just asking the question, Um, but growing in our understanding of how the Bible holds together as one cohesive story absolutely helps. And then reminding ourselves that in any of the stories we read, we're not the main character. Um, And so helping us ask those questions of how does this point to Christ or prepare us for Christ? um, Those are just good questions to ask as we're reading through. Well, for our listeners who are going to pick up a copy of your book and work through it, hopefully in a group study, uh, I would like to ask for you to pray. Pray for our listeners and pray for us as we strive to see Christ from Genesis to Revelation and to grow in Christ and understand our role and our place in the plan of redemption. Would you be willing to pray for our listeners? I would love to. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you and we praise you that you are the one who had a plan to come and rescue us and you wanted to rescue us and that you are powerful enough to rescue us, Lord. I pray that you would be at work in each of our hearts and minds, that you would give us a deeper love, a deeper desire to know you and to know you through your word and to know what your word and how it reveals you. Lord, I pray that you would give us that desire and then satiate it with your word. I pray that you would, by your spirit, illuminate your word, that it would become more beautiful to us, more understandable to us. I pray that that as you do that, that that wouldn't even be the end game, but that you would tether our lives more closely to who you are and to what you're doing, Lord, until that day that you do finally take us all home. Lord, we love you. Help us love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've been talking with Courtney Doctor. Her book is called From Garden to Glory, How Understanding God's Story Changes Yours. It's a great resource and one that I would 
highly recommend to you, especially if you've struggled through any of this series so far in the book of Genesis, and you want to go deeper. You want to be able to see these things for yourself. We want to teach you to be teachers. We want to help you in your seeking of the Lord. So get a copy of this book and find it as a blessing for you and maybe those in your community to dive deeper into God's Word and understand our role and our place in God's redemptive story. Courtney, thank you again so much for this book, but also for your time and our conversation today. Thank you. 